Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for the webinar PFAS, Encouraging Results from OCWD Treatment Study. My name is Crystal Nettles and I'm with the Orange County Water District. We do have some attendees still joining us, but in the interest of time, we have a very robust program this morning, so we do want to get started. Today's webinar is the second in a series of monthly webinars aimed at highlighting some of the programs and projects of OCWD and our program partners. And we are very excited that you are joining us today. Today's webinar will last approximately one hour. And prior to getting started with today's program, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items and introduce our program speakers. As a webinar attendee, you are muted, and this is to reduce background noise. But should you have a question for our speakers, please type your question into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. You may also use the raise hand feature. To keep the webinar moving, speakers will wait until the end of the presentation to answer questions, and written questions will be answered first, followed by those raising their hand. In the event we run out of time and don't get to your question, or if you have any follow-up questions, please email us at info at ocwd.com. Finally, this webinar is being recorded. You will receive a link to the recording tomorrow via email. And with that, I would like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Megan H. Plumley is the Director of Research for the Orange County Water District. She oversees a team of scientists and researchers who coordinate and conduct applied physical, chemical, and biological research that supports and enhances the district's core operational needs. Dr. Plumley holds a doctorate and Master of Science degrees in Environmental Engineering and Science from Stanford University and a bachelor's degree in chemistry with a minor in physics from Pacific University. She is a registered professional civil engineer in the state of California. Joining Dr. Plumley is Dr. Scott A. Grieco. Dr. Grieco is a principal engineer and the global technology leader for emerging contaminants and groundwater treatment with Jacobs. His area of expertise is physical chemical treatment of emerging contaminants and persistent environmental compounds. Dr. Grieco has over 29 years of experience in the evaluation, design, and optimization of water and wastewater treatment systems across the public utility, remediation, and industrial sectors. He has a BS in chemical engineering, MS in environmental engineering, and PhD in bioprocess engineering, and is a registered professional engineer in New York. Thank you both so much for joining us. We will begin today's program. Crystal, I think we lost you. You might be on mute, um, but I can take over. She was just going to transition to our title slide here. So hopefully everybody can hear me okay. This is Megan speaking. So good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, today, we wanted to give you a summary of some preliminary findings from our PFAS treatment study. Um, we aren't finished with this project. We're at about roughly the halfway point. So look for more presentations and, and uh, information sharing in the future. Um, but we do have some preliminary results to share today. Let's see, I'm just working on the controls here. I'm not sure I have control yet, but let's see, bit of a delay there. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so for today's presentation, um, I'll present the first half and then Scott will um, share some findings. So I will talk about just briefly what our PFAS and explain a little bit about what the Orange County Water District does, what do we do, and our local impacts uh, from PFAS. And then talk about our approach for our treatment study to try to identify uh, treatment methods to restore our um, groundwater-based drinking water supply by treating, removing the PFAS. Um, Scott will talk about uh, first some absorption terminology, and then he'll present some preliminary findings and talk about scale-up um, considerations for taking these bench scale or lab scale and pilot scale findings and scaling up to, to predictions for full scale treatment. And I'll wrap up with some, some next steps. So just briefly, what are PFAS? So PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, this is the term or acronym to use for really the whole family of chemicals. There's actually thousands of different perfluorinated and polyfluorinated chemicals that are have related similar structures, but each compound is a, is a unique compound. 
so their um, their character their key characteristic is the fact that they have all these fluorine atoms along the carbon chain and that gives them really special properties that make them very useful to industry and in consumer products. Um, it, they're basically both oil and water repelling and so that's just a very uh, useful feature um, for industrial uses and consumer product uses. Um, two compounds that you might hear about more are, are two individual compounds within this overall family and that's PFOA or perfluorooctanoic acid and PFOS, perfluorooctane sulfonate. So these compounds compared to the other thousands of perfluorinated chemicals are pretty commonly detected, more commonly detected, such as in water, um, either drinking water supplies if they're impacted or natural waters out in the environment. Um, so where do these compounds come from? Um, I mentioned that they have useful properties, so they're used by industry and in consumer products. And through runoff or other contamination steps, these compounds can unfortunately enter the water environment, which means they can enter also um, drinking water supplies potentially. So PFAS has been capturing the nation's attention in many different communities across the country. Um, these are just some of the local Orange County um, newspaper headlines highlighting the issue. Um, they've been dubbed forever chemicals since they're very um, stable, makes, which makes them hard to remove, hard to treat. Um, so these forever chemicals in Orange County drinking water to force widespread well closures. That refers to drinking water wells, so pumping groundwater uh, via a well um, for a drinking water supply. So what does the Orange County Water District do and how are we impacted by PFAS? So we are the managers of the region's groundwater drinking water supply. So we manage the groundwater's quality and quantity. And our service area is shown in the blue shading there on the map. And you can see it covers a number of different cities from Fullerton down to Costa Mesa and the coast and inland to Orange and, and Irvine. And so all of these different cities have groundwater, uh, have drinking water production wells, they're called, to pump groundwater as a drinking water supply. So we manage that supply. So we're a groundwater wholesaler. And then these different uh, water districts, cities, um, are the water retailers. So we were formed in the 1930s to manage this Orange County Groundwater Bay Center Aquifer and protect rights to the Santa Ana River. We, to keep up with demand because of all the pumping of groundwater as a drinking water supply, we have to do active recharge of the groundwater supply. So we take different water supplies, including the Santa Ana River, and we actually infiltrate it into the ground um, to essentially store the water underground. So that's another big part of our mission is the, the recharge. And we have a portfolio of water supplies that we use um, to recharge the groundwater with. So this supply ends up serving as many as two and a half million residents that are in these 19 different municipal and special water districts. And we're really proud that we are able to provide three quarters of the local water supply through this, this local source of water, groundwater, given that other places in, in Southern California are really pretty highly dependent on importing water from far away, which is costly and takes a lot of energy. But here we're able to rely um, a lot on our just local groundwater supplies. So unfortunately that groundwater, we can detect low concentrations of PFAS. So any community faced with a situation like that starts by investigating where could this PFAS be coming from. So this is just one brief slide to give you a snapshot of the potential local PFAS sources that are being investigated. PFAS can end up in surface water and groundwaters from specific industrial uses or you know, military bases, airports, certain industries like chrome plating, um, landfills, if there was some kind of issue with um, contamination coming off the landfill site. Um, but right now, so far, no indications from, from local landfills, um, industrial releases, um, fire training areas, because PFAS um, is used in certain firefighting foams, so fire training areas can be a potential source. But also, we have to remember that these PFAS compounds are in commonly used products, such as in, in homes and businesses, um, even a popcorn bags and, and floss, different brands of these products can use PFAS because of the oil and water repelling properties. They're very useful, but unfortunately that means just through the, the use of these products, essentially runoff from, from water um, over these products can, it goes into the sewer collection system from homes and businesses 
And so you end up with PFAS entering into the sewage and that uh, water is treated by your local wastewater treatment plant to make the to clean the water and make it suitable for discharge to the environment. Uh, unfortunately, you know, those plants were never designed to remove PFAS, which is really challenging to remove. So this PFAS just sort of passes through the wastewater treatment plants and ends up in treated wastewater effluent and discharges. So that's another way that PFAS can enter um, the water environment in different communities and end up inadvertently entering into your drinking water supply, potentially. Um, so in our case, I mentioned that we rely on the Santa Ana River as a water supply where we recharge this water into our groundwater storage. And that um, river, its base flow is actually dominated by upstream uh, treated, tertiary treated wastewater discharges. And we're able to detect PFAS at the concentrations shown there, typically a median concentration, for example, of around 20 nanograms per liter for PFOA which is a very, very low concentration, um, but nevertheless, we're able to detect it due to advanced um, chemical methods. And this is not a huge surprise that we find it in the sense that in the literature, it's well established and it's just understood that PFAS can occur in conventionally treated wastewater discharges. So given that this river is dominated by discharges, especially in the summer months, we can detect the PFAS. And we also do see some PFAS detections in stormwater runoff to the Santa Ana River. And so I mentioned that this river supply is part of our water supply portfolio for recharge. It's an example uh, portfolio pie chart for a, a recent water year. You can see the river recharge is an important part of our overall portfolio. I also wanted to highlight the groundwater replenishment system in the purple there. Um, that is our, some of you may know um, Orange County Water District by its um, advanced water purification facility that we call the groundwater replenishment system. This uh, takes uh, wastewater and treats it to an advanced degree to make it suitable as a drinking water. So it's highly treated with reverse osmosis and that actually removes the PFAS. So I just wanted to highlight that the recycled water uh, project is not, um, uh, uh, is not, does not have uh, PFAS in the final product water that's recharged into the, the groundwater. So what's the extent of this PFAS impact in groundwater across our service area? Um, so based on uh, PFAS information uh, from samples collected from different monitoring wells um, and production wells, there is some detectable PFAS and 11 of those 19 different water retailers that I mentioned on one of my earlier slides do show some impact in the sense that they have detectable levels of PFOA above the response level number of 10 parts per trillion or nanograms per liter. On the left side, you can see the box there summarizing our current California Division of Drinking Water notification levels and response levels. Um, previously, the response level was a bit higher and recently in earlier this year, it was reduced to individual limits for PFOA at 10 and PFOS at 40 nanograms per liter. And this is the level at which the state um, recommends that uh, water agencies voluntarily remove a, a source from service, a supply of the drinking water from service. And so, of course, the, re the water retailers in our service area are taking this very seriously. And this means that up to a third of our groundwater basin supply production could be unable to be served based on these concentrations. Um, what do you do in the meantime? Where do you get your drinking water? So these cities have to look at options. Um, one could be um, to import, uh, to, to purchase higher uh, volumes than, than you might in a typical year of imported water, and, but that's very costly. So there's significant um, economic impacts of, of the PFAS in our service area. So what are we doing? We can't just buy a lot of imported water forever. We want to restore our local groundwater supply. So to do that, we need to design treatment systems to remove the PFAS. And I'm not going into detail on design today. That's another parallel project happening at the district is our pre-design and design work. Um, today, I'm talking about the treatment technologies, but just to give you a snapshot, um, how this would work is if you have a given drinking water production well, like shown in the blue box there, at an example site layout, a wellhead treatment system located right there at the well could be installed to remove the PFAS. So design work is underway for 10 different water agencies, each of whom may have several wells. 
and the goal is to bring these systems online as soon as we can within one to three years to be able to restore the groundwater supply. So what is our treatment study about? So there are a number of technologies that could be used to remove PFAS from groundwater. Um, right towards the beginning of our project, we focused in on technologies that were more mature since we knew we needed to design and install these systems quickly and, uh, you know, proven at other sites and more economical um, as far as overall cost of the project. So we focused in on adsorbent based technology. But there's a number of different absorbents potentially. So our project is essentially testing the performance of these different absorbents, both at lab scale and at pilot scale. So here I show um, granular activated carbon, ion exchange resins, and also novel absorbents that don't fall into the kind of conventional GAC or IX categories um, that are being marketed for PFAS removal. And so the idea is you put the absorbent into a large vessel like the ones shown in the picture and you pass the water through the system and the PFAS absorbs to the adsorbent and that's how it's removed from the water. So the water just passes through and the PFAS gets removed. So we, I mentioned we are doing both pilot scale and lab scale testing. So our pilot program, the um, pilot system is located adjacent to one of our recharge ponds that recharges Santa Ana River water, that's Warner Basin. And it's fed from a district owned non-potable well that has similar um, PFAS and water quality to other wells in the area. So this is the water being fed into the pilot system. And um, the, this, is a, this is a photo of the um, building that houses the pilot next to the um, Warner Basin Pond. And uh, you, some members of the audience might have heard that our um, project is the largest PFAS pilot in the nation for um, you know, treatment study to remove PFAS from water. So you might be a little underwhelmed by the small size of this building. When we say it's a, you know, a large pilot, what we're really referring to is the number of different adsorbents that we're looking at. So we're looking at eight different granular activated carbon products, four different ion exchange resins, and two novel adsorbents. That's just a lot of different uh, products. The typical project, um, if it does piloting at all, it might just do two, three, or four. Um, but there has been a bit of an explosion in it very recently in the number of potential products out there, and we wanted to be comprehensive in our study, so we upsized it. So we commissioned the pilot in December. It's been running for about six months now. And for those of you interested in some of the design criteria, the empty bed contact time is a key criteria and criterion, and we um, decided on values uh, also in talking to the vendors in collaboration with these technology providers, we decided on EBCTs that were representative of what you would see in a full scale. So a 10 minute for GAC and a two minute for the ion exchange would be typical of a full scale application. And then the same for the novel adsorbents, the manufacturers made their recommendations and these EBCTs is what they would recommend for a full scale installation. So this is what the GAC pilot looks like. It's two skids that each hold four columns and they're each packed with the GAC material. We can see the black color in the columns. And then the ion exchange skid has a six column capacity and we're using four of the positions for the IX products and two for the novel adsorbents. So what's the kind of data we're looking to, to get? I wanted to show this uh, sort of example theoretical slides since it'll look similar to some of the data that Scott's going to show. So first off, the picture on the left, just to remind you that the, the idea here is pretty basic. Your influent water goes in and it has some detectable PFAS in it, but the effluent water that comes out should be PFAS free. So these adsorbent technologies can remove all the PFAS down to, you know, non-detectable levels based on the chemical analytical method that you're using. So the x-axis on this chart represents either the cumulative volume that you're treating over time or just you can plot it against time. And the y-axis is the PFAS concentration. It might be PFOA that we're particularly interested in, in the treated water. So initially you see non-detect, so plotted here at, at a theoretical zero. Um, but after a while, hopefully several months worth of time in a full-scale application or longer, um, you will start to see some PFAS coming, uh, breaking through, it's called, into your effluent. Um, you're essentially beginning to use up 
the capacity or the adsorption sites of your adsorbent. So eventually it can't remove all the PFAS and you start seeing a little bit coming through and that concentration goes up and up. And in a full scale um, real treatment system, you would have some limit to how much you allow to break through into your effluent. And then you would just replace the product with fresh product to start at the beginning again. And in the bench and pilot testing, we allow that curve to evolve further. And if you take it all the way to the end, eventually the adsorbent is fully exhausted. And so the effluent concentration of PFAS will match your influent concentration. So this is a theoretical breakthrough curve. So in addition to the pilot, we're doing smaller scale um, laboratory testing or bench scale testing um, using a standard method called rapid small scale column testing or RSSCT. Um, this can be performed with activated carbon and crushable adsorbents. So we're doing it for the GAC and the novel adsorbents, but not for the ion exchange, which are those four products are only in the pilot. And it's, a, it's, it's again, a large scope. We, a typical project might just be a, a few products. We expanded the RSSCT to look at more uh, products. And the advantage over the pilot, so the pilot takes a long time to see that breakthrough eventually happen. And that's how you assess performance, is how, how long does the product last for you before it has to be replaced. But the pilot lasts as long as a full scale. So it's gonna take many months to really evolve that whole breakthrough curve and get good information. But the advantage with a lab scale test is they're just designed differently to speed up the kinetics. And so you get that curve or you get your results within just a few weeks. So since it's so fast, we're able to use it to screen multiple waters. So we're running the RSSET with all the different products on a particular city's drinking water supply. But then we switch to a different water supply. So we're doing the same test for, for a number of different um, local water retailers that we call groundwater producers. So we're doing this for, um, I think that number might be out of date, uh, up, to tw up to 12 um, different producers. And um, the idea with the lab scale data is that you can then use it to predict full scale performance through modeling. So this just gives you a sense for where these waters are that we're testing. So these, the red dots are different um, drinking water production wells and we're collecting pretty large volumes of water from each of these wells and using that to do the small scale, um, lab scale column testing for the GAC and novel adsorbents. So the idea is to really use this bench and pilot scale data together. Um, we'll take the pilot scale GAC results and, and update or fine tune the RSSCT predicted full scale performance. And then the pilot will also allow us to compare um, the performance of ion exchange to GAC. And overall, our objective is to evaluate all of these different adsorbents against the different water qualities and really make product recommendations for each water retailer. So with that, I will turn it over to Scott and he will first introduce a bit about the, um, some of the terminology and then he'll show some preliminary uh, findings from our lab scale testing as well as compared to the pilot. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Megan. Before we get into the data, I, yeah, I would like to cover a few basic terms that describe adsorption, and I'm just going to wait for the uh, control to catch up. There it is. So adsorption is controlled by both the adsorbent properties and the water chemistry, what we often term matrix effects, and these can be interrelated. Um, the adsorption properties determine kinetics, how fast the adsorption occurs and capacity, how much the adsorbent can hold. Um, in addition to the target PFAS compounds, um, compounds such as naturally occurring organics or inorganic compounds can also compete with the PFAS adsorption or follow the adsorbent service, surface. So um, the, these all factor into the actual performance of the adsorbents that we're testing. So this is a picture of the adsorption vessel like Megan showed. Um, the adsorption volume, it, it, the adsorbent is the dotted volume inside the vessel there. So one of the important design terms is surface loading rate. So this is defined as the flow rate divided by the surface area of the adsorbent. And this is a simple way to define the water velocity through the vessel. The other term that we often use is empty bed contact time or EBCT. And this is the volume of the media divided by the flow rate in the system. 
Um, this is considered empty bed because it doesn't consider the specific space occupied by the adsorbent. So it's a term that's independent of the media type. And as mentioned, uh, typical in, in what we're using for, for our testing is that for GAC, the typical EBCT and SLRs are 10 minutes and four to eight gallons per minute per square foot. And for ion exchange, uh, the typical values are two minutes and somewhere between seven and 12 gallons a minute per square foot. And the difference in the values with the ion exchange being lower is that th that material typically exhibits faster kinetics in the GEC. So you can run it, uh, run it faster and run it with, with a smaller bed volume. So the main part of this project is focused on the bench scale, which involves the RSSCT testing that Megan previously showed. And here's a quick example of how an RSSCT works. For our lab scale RSSCT column, we have a small scale adsorbent particle diameter. Um, then we scale that to a large scale column in the field, either the pilot or the full scale, with a known adsorbent particle diameter in EBCT. The RSSCT design is a simple fixed relationship between the adsorbent particle sizes. So this equates to a fixed EBCT ratio, which is then directly proportional to a column runtime. So what that really means is, if for an example, um, if we have a 12 by 40 mesh size GAC product, which is a, a typical application for the pilot and the field scale, and if, if we have a 10 minute uh, typical empty bed contact time for that, that product, then the RS, RSSCT test can be run for 15 days, and that will represent more than 22 months of full scale operation. So it's a very schedule efficient way to do the, 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 the design and evaluation for adsorbent systems. So now I'll go over the preliminary test results. And because of the delay due to COVID, we've completed four of the planned well water sources. And the fifth source is, is currently underway. Uh, this is a summary of all the RSSCT results received to date. So of the seven carbon products being tested on each well source, um, there are bituminous coal-based products and non-bituminous coal-based products. Uh, the data are shown with bed volumes treated on the left and equivalent days of full-scale treatment on the right. Um, the blue and orange bars represent the average performance of the types of carbons being tested. And the error bars on, on each of those are, are for each carbon group show the best and the least performing carbon products for each of the well water tested. So as a group, the bituminous products generally outperform the non-bituminous products. And in looking at the best performing products, the data indicate that the bituminous products are substantially better. You may also have noticed that uh, differences in the well water source itself, where the best performing product on well water one lasts less than a year, but the same product on well, well water two lasts more than three years. So the PFAS adsorption capacity is highly influenced by water quality. And the primary constituent impacting the PFAS adsorption is dissolved organic carbon. So using that same set of data as on the previous slide, this figure shows the water volume treated as a function of the dissolved organic carbon concentration. The, D the DOC observed so far in our testing ranges from approximately 0 0.5 milligrams per liter up to 1.6 milligrams per liter. And of note, at the high DOC concentration, you can see that there's similar performance between the carbon types. However, as the DOC concentration decreases, the better performing bituminous products substantially outperform the non-bituminous products tested. And again, you can see the wide range in those error bars, which represent the results of, of each product type. And for even for the bituminous products, um, this is why we're doing product testing on the actual water source and why it's recommended prior to selecting as an, a, a, selecting a specific adsorbent, you know, given the range and variability that we see during testing. 
So the testing also considered virgin GAC, which has not been used before compared to reactivated GAC, where after a, a product is, is used in the field, it can be returned and reactivated um, and then returned into, into service. So looking at both virgin GAC and reactivated GAC for three of the well waters, including the highest and the lowest TOC observed, the virgin product outperformed the reactivated product. And the relative performance difference appears to be a function of the DOC. The performance difference decreases as the DOC concentration increases. And at the, the lowest DOC that we've tested to date, 0 0.5 milligrams per liter, the difference is actually about 20%, which is, which is pretty significant. The test results from Wellwater 2 show that reactivated GAC nominally outperformed the virgin GAC. So these results suggest that um, on a whole, the reactivated product may not be consistent consistently outperform or may not consistently perform as well as the virgin product. Um, and the magnitude of the difference does seem to be a, a function of the background DOC. So as we get into moving forward with, with more tests and, and looking at the pattern, as well as looking at you know, selection of material and economics, this, this will play into that, that mindset as well. So all the results I've shown have focused on the PFOA. And these, of these two compounds with the established NL and RL values, um, PFOA has a lower RL of the 10 nanograms per liter and is typically less adsorbable than PFOS. So that has been our kind of our, our, our go-to compound in terms of looking at design and, and consideration of the systems. But looking at the broader range of PFAS, what we, what we have observed on the GAC is consistent to what other system performance data looks like. Uh, the longer chains and sulfonic acids have a higher capacity than the shorter chain compounds and carb carboxylic acids. And also what we see is that the sulfonic acids of a shorter chain length, uh, like the six carbon PFHXS or the four carbon PFBS, are better absorbed than the longer carboxylic acids, uh, you know, that, that fall out in the chain right next to them, like the A-chain PFOA or the six carbon PFHXA. So um, although the, in general, the mindset is that the sulfonates uh, absorb better than the carboxylic acids and long chains are, are better than short chains, you can see that it's often kind of a staggered effect. Um, and, and this is pretty consistent to what we see in other programs. We also have some preliminary data from the field scale pilot. So for each of the seven GAC products tested at both scales, uh, this figure shows the effluent concentration of the pilot at 150 days of operation, which is the extent of the pilot data we currently have available. Um, and the RSSCT results at the equivalent of 150 days of full scale operation. You can see that the RSSCT columns break through sooner than the pilot column. Um, and this is generally anticipated since the columns are operated under what's called a constant diffusivity design assumption for the RSSCT. And this often sh has been shown to provide more conservative runtime estimates when compared to a larger scale system. And you can also see from this figure that it, it that appears to be a function of the, the actual carbon product type. So this factor will be taken into account when we're scaling the RSSCT results for the producer well waters which don't have a related pilot system. We'll use the same factor to relate to a full scale system um, for, for the all the rest of the producer well waters that, that don't have the associated pilot that's at the Orange County facility. And in addition to the GAC data, uh, preliminary pilot data are also available for the ion exchange media. So two items of note, um, first, you'll notice that the graphs are plotted at a baseline of two nanograms per liter, which is actually the method reporting limit. So all of the two nanogram per liter values um, from zero up till we start to see an increase are actually below detection. And secondly, um, we've mentioned the novel media a couple times, and these were started later in the process. Um, they, they got a little bit later start than the ion exchange media. So as being started up later, they currently don't actually have any effluent detections to report yet. So um, all we have right now for preliminary data is our comparison of GAC and an ion exchange. 
the effluent detections of the PFOA were observed earlier in the GAC than ion exchange, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side of the graphs. And it should be noted that these products are showing, uh, that show the earliest breakthrough are the products that showed the early breakthrough on the RSSCT as well. However, you can also see that there are some products with, without detections yet. And the best performing GAC and ion exchange products are currently showing similar performance with these lower or no, no detections. Um, as we get more data, we'll see if, if those results remain similar. Then on the right, what I have presented is the PFHXA, the, the, the six carbon uh, PFAS. And, and that's interesting because um, if, you, if you take a look at those data, three of the four ion exchange products showed much earlier breakthrough than the GAC, um, which isn't necessarily always reported that way. So that, that's definitely interesting that the ion exchange products are showing a bit, uh, bit quicker breakthrough. And only three of, the six, or three of the eight GAC products are currently showing detections um, as of 150 days. So I'd like to discuss uh, a little bit more about the, uh, the scale-up considerations and how, we're, how we are using these data to predict full-scale operations. Um, so we're evaluating uh, several different products. And it, you, for, to, to try to kind of represent uh, the graphic here, let's just consider product A and B for example purposes. And, at an RSSCT and pilot scale, um, we're, we're using those data to relate these results to full scale systems. And in this case, we're assuming that product A and product B have the, the same empty bed contact time. So when we're evaluating products like carbon with, with, with same empty bed contact time values, the bed volumes between products A and B are equal and the relationship between the RSSCT pilot full scale and, and RSSCT are exact. So what that means is one bo bed volume equals one bed volume at any scale. So let me expand on this. Um, if we're using a simple example of a 10 minute empty bed contact time and we're gonna design a system for a thousand gallons a minute, um, that means for the full scale, one bed volume is 10,000 gallons. So the RSSCT data show the PFOA effluent concentrations as a function of the bed volumes treated. And if we choose a target effluent concentration of one or 10 nanograms per liter, GACA can treat 75,000 bed volumes before it reaches that limit. So this equates to 17 months of continuous treatment at 1,000 gallons a minute. However, GACB can treat 160,000 bed volumes, which equates to 39 months of continuous treatment at 1,000 gallons a minute. So this is more than double the treatment capacity of pr product B versus product A in this particular test. But when we're evaluating what we consider dissimilar products, such as GAC and ion exchange, or some of the novel products that have different empty bed contact time values, the bed volumes between product A and product B are not equal. So the products will treat different volumes of water over the same time period. So in our example, the GAC system is what we saw on the previous slide. However, the ion exchange vessel is designed for that two minute empty bed contact time. So the bed volume is uh, 2000 gallons at 1000 gallons a minute. So here are the similar test results that we just saw. The GAC treated 75,000 bed volumes, which is 17 months. The ion exchange can treat 188,000 bed volumes. But these bed volumes are actually five times smaller if you look at the math up in the top boxes. So this equates to less than half the volume of water treated or a treatment duration of 8.5 months. So if, if data are presented as a function of bed volumes, um, the moral of this story is you should be really careful to understand the EBCT of the products that are being presented on, on those data. 
So in order to evaluate products on an equal basis, they must have equal units. And if the EBCT values are not equal, volume treated or treatment try time is the best choice. And of course, presenting all the data in these units is, is always acceptable and, and, and avoids confusion. So taking the example on the last side, you can see if we convert that to volume treated, the difference is now graphically obvious and intuitive. So lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we're using these data for actual full-scale design of treatment systems. So a system in practice will also uh, often have two vessels in series. Uh, this is considered a lead lag train. The data here are, uh, are uh, shown in PFOA effluent concentrations as a function of full-scale operation uh, in days very similar to the curves we've seen in, in the, the, uh, the example curve that Megan presented. So the black line is the effluent of the lead bed and the blue line is the effluent of the lag bed. These are model projection fits from the actual projected RSSCT data. Uh, there are two goals when we're operating a lead lag system in practice. One, the system effluent needs to meet the treatment criteria. That's pretty obvious. But two, the system maximize, should maximize the use of the selected adsorbent. And, and that's obviously to maximize the, 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 the economics and minimize the cost. So when the adsorbent needs to be changed out, the, if you can follow the figure on the left there, the lead bed is typically removed. The lag bed is, it becomes the lead bed um, by changing the valving and fresh carbon is placed in the lag position. The lag bed is minimally loaded with PFAS and so this allows better use of the adsorbent rather than replacing both beds simultaneously with fresh material. So if you go back to the, the actual performance output um, in, in model projections, in, in the first case, we identify the the, the target response level of 10 nanograms per liter to change out the carbon um, in the first bed, shown as that yellow line. And you can see that the lead bed is just over 50% of its total capacity, and the system effluent is still less than a detection, uh, uh, less than detection and it's uh, actually numerically at 0 0.1 nanograms per liter. But if we target a system effluent of say 0 0.5 nanograms per liter, um, which is still at or below the analytical method detection limit, and, and that's represented by the red line, we can maximize the capacity of the lead bed prior to change out. So this results in an improvement of 5.4 months of adsorbent life uh, extension. And if the target effluent is increased even further, uh, not knowing what you know the actual target value is for effluent, you know uh, the more you increase the target effluent value, obviously the the more the efficiency of the lead bed increases as well. Um, so this gives you an example of how we're using the test data in going to an actual system design. So under this program, we're considering the product type, um, the well water quality, the target effluent objectives, in, in, in wrapping all that together in terms of uh, performance data and modeling to help select the most technically feasible and cost effective, i.e. the best value product for each system using this type of analysis. So with that, I uh, would like to conclude my portion of this webinar and I thank you for the time and now I'll turn it back over to Megan to wrap up uh, the technical presentation piece. Okay, thanks Scott. So um, this is the last um, slide here um, once I have control here and just to kind of tell you where we're going next. Um, so I mentioned that we're not uh, quite finished with this product yet, um, uh, project yet. Scott talked about how we still have a few products to uh, or excuse me, a few producer waters to test as part of our um, lab scale program where we're doing the same RSSCT testing, but on a number of different um, uh, water types collected from the different drinking water wells. So we're gonna continue with that testing um, and also continue running the pilot, um, which um, as we mentioned, takes you know by definition longer to see that breakthrough curve evolve. So we are about six months into our pilot now, we need to allow several more months to pass by us to watch that breakthrough evolution for the different products. And I'm not sure, Crystal, if you still have control, you could just click for me because it looks like it's not moving forward. Um, 
And then um, finally to do that uh, best value analysis that Scott, there we go, that Scott mentioned. So taking into account not only the performance in terms of which products seem to last longer, but what is the cost of that particular product um, to, to roll it all together and to come up with recommendations for the different um, well sites. Um, next slide. So with that, I'll just quickly make some acknowledgements. Next slide again. Um, our Orange County Water District Research Team and Water Quality Department, also other members of the Jacobs team working with Scott on the project, and then Jacobs is working with Patel, who is the laboratory um, doing the um, lab scale testing. And then one more slide, just to acknowledge our technology partners. Um, if you advance forward there, um, these are the different um, manufacturers of the, the, the products that we're evaluating. Um, and so with that, I think we have some time for questions. Thank you so much um, to Dr. Plumley and Dr. Uh, Grico for the informative presentation. We do have some time left for questions and our speakers have graciously agreed to stay a little past 11 to answer any additional questions that come in. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please type your question into the Q&A box or raise your hand to speak and we'll temporarily unmute you. And once again, if we don't have time to get to your question, please email us at info at OCWD.com. I also wanted to take the opportunity um, to introduce OCWD's Executive Director of Water Quality and Technical Resources, Jason Datticus, who is available to answer questions as well. So starting off the questions, this one comes from Robert Craw. What materials are defined by non-bituminous carbons? Scott? So uh, we actually have uh, two different products. Uh, one is still a coal-based product, and it's it's lignite. So um, it, when you when you look at the range of of mined coal material, there's subbituminous, uh, bituminous lignite type coal. So one one particular product type we have is a lignite-based product, um, and the other particular type is actually not a coal-based product. Um, it's actually the base material is coconut shell. So so it's an enhanced coconut shell product. Wonderful. Our next question comes to us anonymously. How is GAC reactivated? Scott, I think you can take that one as well. Okay. Um, so in the in the uh, I guess just to to, to cover it at a, a a shorter high level in in the activation process to create. Um, create the carbon product, uh, the base material is brought into an activation process at, at high temperature uh, and pressure, and sometimes chemicals are used. Um, this basically creates the pore structure um, you know, with, within the, the carbon to, 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 to activate it and, and create the surface absorption spots. Um, when a product is, is, is reused, um, or, or, or is is consumed and, and ready to be sent back um, in its full of a contaminant product or organic like PFAS, it's actually the reactivation process actually takes the used carbon and brings it right back to that high temperature, um, high e activation process at the beginning. Um, the, the, the products like PFAS are, are, are baked off, for lack of a better term, uh, and, and volatilized and, and thermally oxidized uh, within the off-gas treatment. Now, I, I guess I will put a uh, disclaimer on, on that comment that you know, the, the extent of destruction of PFAS is, is certainly a concern of the EPAs right now. And you know, there's, there, there are studies going on to, to look at the, the effectiveness of that um, off-gas treatment in terms of uh, destruction of organic compounds specifically related to PFAS. But in general, that's how every uh, organic contaminant is, you know, re reprocessed off of carbon um, in, in, the, in, in the production and reactivation process. Thank you. Next question comes to us from Silvana Gu, and I apologize if I mispronounced your last name. How many wells will be tested at pilot level? I can answer that. So we're doing a combination of lab scale testing and pilot scale testing and really using the data together. So really it's just the one pilot, which is on the OCWD, 
fed by an OCWD owned well. And that's the one I showed on the map with the red star. So that's the pilot scale test and it has all of the products. So the GAC products and the ion exchange resins and the novel absorbents. A subset of those products, the GAC and novel absorbents are also being evaluated at lab scale because that lets us change out the feed water to all the different um, water types that, um, across the um, retail agencies to evaluate to what extent does water quality of that feed water play and have an influence. And we can really use the data together to then make full scale, to make projections of performance at full scale. So like what would be the products that last the longest and for how long, how often would they have to be changed out? So hopefully that answers your question. It's the one pilot test that we're using together with a series of lab scale tests of different waters. All right, the next question comes to us from Nicole Blute. How did the novel adsorbents perform compared to GAC and ion exchange? Scott, do you wanna, we only have preliminary data, but Scott might be able to make some remarks based on what we're seeing. Yeah, I can, I can, I can make some preliminary comments on that. So um, we didn't have a large data set. We haven't, it, because we're um, flip-flopping back and forth between the novel, novel absorbents on the bench scale, um, we have a limited set of data and uh, we wanted to wait to have more data before we presented that. And then of course, as I mentioned, we don't have any results yet on the pilot scale, they're still non-detect. But the, the limited data we do have uh, suggests that you know, they're performing um, a, as well, if, if not better than um, the, the existing um, commercial products between GAC and ion exchange. Um, there, there are differences between the novel products you know, in terms of the performance um, but we, do, we don't have enough of a data set yet to, to be conclusive across the wider range of, of water types that we're seeing with the background organic carbon. Um, but I, I guess that's, I, I guess I'll leave it at that, that, you know, they're, they're performing well uh, in, in, in often performing better. All right. And a similar question from Dave Mark, what costs less to change out GAC or ion exchange? Do you want to answer that one too? Yeah, that that's a bit of a loaded question. I <laughs> guess uh, the the simple way to answer that is, um, you know, it's going to come down to evaluating the economics in the performance, like we we looked at in the slides. Um, if the answer is what costs less per you know per per vessel loading. Um, on on a you know on a unit basis, I an exchange material uh, costs more uh, on a unit cost basis than, than GAC, but that's not nearly the whole picture. The whole picture is how long does it last and, and what the economics are. So um, although the, the, the upfront cost of, of the initial loading of ion exchange may be a bit more of a, a, a capital investment, if you will, or an upfront investment, not capital, but an upfront investment, um, it, it, it could potentially last longer. So, you know, the economic could, could weigh out in that favor. Um. Thank you. Uh, next question comes to us anonymously. What do you plan to do with the spent carbon at full scale? So we are um, currently in our treatment study just focusing on comparing the initial performance as far as how long the products last and then doing the best value analysis that Scott talked about. So then in terms of the design for each city's project, so that question will have to be answered. So kind of case by case with each city and how they want to approach their operations, um, whether to react, if, if they select GAC over other absorbents, um, how they, if they want to do reactivation or not. All right, and the next question from Robert Richardson. Do you anticipate any auxiliary benefits to water quality other than the removal of PFOA, POFOS for this project? Yeah, so we haven't, we are, are doing a more comprehensive water quality, water quality sampling. So we're not just looking at PFAS, we're measuring um, general water quality and a few other target contaminants. So we don't have much to, to say on that yet, but we are looking at that um, as a, and Scott, maybe you can expand, but as a broad comment, I would just say, you know, the, for example, the granular activated carbon can be fairly agnostic. It's just kind of absorbing organic compounds and that's why you have competition where your dissolved organic carbon of any type will absorb to the GAC 
and foul it over time and use up positions that could have been used to sort of a PFAS. So we think of it more like a competition or a fouling, but it also just means that organics are being sorbed out of the water. And then ion exchange could be more selective, like it's just sorbing certain types of compounds, but certainly a few things beyond PFAS. And novel adsorbents just depends on what, how the material is designed and what its adsorption properties are. So you, could, you can get some co-benefits. So Scott, I don't know if there's anything more you wanna to add to that. No, I think that's good. Um, yeah, I, I, I think some of the other things that we, we typically talk about um, in terms of water quality, like within organics and things like that, it, you know, iron, manganese, it won't do anything like that for those types of constituents. So it, it would, it really, I guess it really does depend on, on what your other target compounds may be. All right, next question comes from Eugene Rosenbaum. How would you compare presented technologies with RO in terms of efficiency, cost, discharge, et cetera? Yeah, so as a broad um, answer to that, um, RO does tend to cost more, maybe quite a bit more. So we didn't have time to talk about that today, but, our, but the work that Jacob's team is doing looking at technologies and um, best value includes consideration of membranes, so RO, and that will actually nanofiltration. So there is some lab testing being done and it's gonna be included. Um, essentially, we're expecting it to just be a lot higher cost. Um, broadly, another concern with membrane-based treatment is that it's a, um, the feed water goes in, clean water comes out, but so does a liquid waste stream that has the carries away the contaminants that got removed since it's a separation technology. So then that liquid waste stream has to be disposed of and figuring out how to manage that at a real site with a, and it's a huge volume of water potentially because it's such a large drinking water production well that now, even though just a fraction of that becomes liquid waste, it's still a large flow. So you're also kind of wasting some water, right? Because it's now just concentrate that has to be disposed of rather than making a drinking water. So those are some of the main concerns about membranes. Scott, I don't know if you want to add anything about um, kind of the overall comparison of, of GAC and ion exchange to membranes that I might have missed. Yeah, I would just say in general, I mean, we, we get into that evaluation a lot for, for other locations and, and, and other clients. And, um, you know, it, it typically falls off the radar because of cost and complexity. Um, the other reason that it, it often falls off the radar, which may not be completely relevant to Southern California, but you also are transferring it from one, you know, you're transferring the PFAS from one liquid stream to another liquid stream. So um, you're still going to have to manage a liquid stream a PFAS in, in, in Southern California, if you can manage the brine from the RO in a brine pipe, then maybe the, the problem, you know, goes away. But in, in most cases, it doesn't go away. The next question comes from Agata Bugala. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Why is OCWD not able to do RSSCT testing on ion exchange resins? Yeah, so I'll let Scott expand on that, but um, the RSSCT standardized methodology is considered um, appropriate um, for crushable adsorbents. You have to crush the particle size to make it smaller to get the change in kinetics that makes the test go faster compared to a pilot test. So you can crush GAC and the novel adsorbents that we're using, we also considered crushable after consultation with the vendors. But there's a little bit of a debate in the industry about whether it's appropriate to crush ion exchange resins and use them in a lab scale test. So we stepped away from that and just said we would not include ion exchange in our lab scale testing. But there are, but you will see other folks doing that and literature on that. So I think methods are being developed and people are getting more confidence, but we, we chose not to do it. So Scott, not sure if you want to add anything to that. The, the only thing I'll add to that is the PFAS space, if, if people are not aware, has, you know, been growing in terms of uh, exponentially in terms of knowledge over the last couple of years. So um, four years ago, nobody really ever thought about, you know, crushing an ion exchange bead for, for any practical purposes. And when we started this, this program with Orange County a year ago, um, there was very limited information on that. I think that you'll find more academics and, and practitioners doing it now, but as Megan said, um, 
you know, it's, it, it's not widely um, utilized in practice. So um, I still feel comfortable that, you know, as, as, the, as the PFAS world pushes technologies and treatment a little bit further, I think that that will become maybe a common practice down the road, but there's just not a lot of support for um, results and procedures that we would expect out of it at this point. All right, and um, just so everyone knows, it is 11 o'clock right now, but Dr. Plumley and Dr. Grieco have graciously agreed to stay on for another 15 minutes or so to answer questions. We do have quite a bit of questions, um, I, uh, over 20 uh, questions, along with someone raising their hand, so we'll try and get to as many as possible, but as a reminder, you are welcome to email us at info at ocwd.com if we don't get to your question today. All right, our next question is anonymous. Any bench pilot results from novel adsorbents? Scott, do you wanna answer that? Yeah, I think we covered that. I mean, we, we don't have any results yet um, on the pilot scale because they were started up a few months after the previous uh, startup for the ion exchange in, in carbon. And we do have some results right now, uh, one set of results from, from, from each material on the bench scale, but we were waiting for more before we um, went out public with, with actually presenting that. Okay, the next question comes from Emily Mosier. Was the performance difference of virgin versus reactivated carbon greater for low DOC waters? E, the answer is yes to that. So um, as the, as it, was, it was an inverse relationship. So as the DOC decreases, the, the, the difference increased. Okay. Our next question is anonymous. Time or volume of water used on the x-axis comparing GAC and ion exchange can also be misleading. GAC is five times the volume of media, right? Shouldn't dollars be the final comparison between technologies? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I mean, getting to the point of having equal units is is true, and you're absolutely right. You, you have to look at the economics. Um, we we weren't in a position we wanted to present the technical findings um, in, in those, the, the, getting everything on an equal axis or equal footing is the first step. And then the economics is obviously the, the second step of that equation. Yeah, and I'll just add my, my short answer to that is you could have a product that lasts a really long time. So you think you're gonna save money because you don't have to change it out very often. But what if it's one of the costliest products on a, um, you know, cents per pound basis. So I'm just repeating what, what Scott said, but that's what we're calling the best value analysis is taking into account costs. So given the time limits today and the preliminary kind of status of our cost work, we didn't share, share that information today, but that is one of our next steps is to do, put everything on an equal footing, and, uh, as you say, by um, looking at the best value. All right, the next question comes from Rick Zimmer. Is the treatment goal to remove to the notification level? And are you also evaluating the seven other PFAS compounds that we'll soon be establishing notification levels for? Yeah, so I, I might actually ask Jason to jump on and, and take that question. Um, uh, my short answer would be that this is a agency by agency decision. They'll have to develop an operational plan for their full scale system and Orange County Water District will be working with them on that. So you're right, a decision will be have, have to be made what is your effluent sort of trigger threshold concentration of PFAS at which time you would change out the product? So, so Jason, if you're on, the question was, what's the treatment goal? Is it to meet the notification level? And what about other types of PFAS besides PFOA? Yeah, so I think um, certainly the initial treatment goal and, and all the system design will be capable of treating to, uh, treating to not detect. Um, with current analytical methods. Uh, but as Megan alludes to, um, I think we're still working out the details of um, what the goal is in terms of what will trigger a, a change out of the media. Um, we're trying to use the piling data to help us inform that. Um, certainly the notification level is, is relevant to that. Um, also, given the state is working on MCL, uh, ultimately that will be a, a, significant, a significant guidepost in, uh, in that as well. So. Um, 
but yeah, that's something we're definitely definitely working on as a part of the, the project. Uh, and in terms of the seven additional PFAS compounds um, that the state is working on notification levels for, um, yeah, I believe those are all covered by, by EPA method 537.1, um, which is the analytical method we're um, using consistently for our, our PFAS monitoring of the pilot. So we will have information on those uh, as well. Thank you, Jason. Our next question comes to us from David Schizzle. I saw a lot of data, uh, data on PFOA. What about media performance differences on sulfonates, such as PFOS, PFBS, PFHSX? Is there any interest in expanding the target analyte list to capture performance of a wider range of PFAS chemistry? Yeah, I can answer that. So we are certainly interested in other types of PFAS, and Jason mentioned that the, the state is working on notification limits for more compounds beyond PFOA and PFOS. So um, fortunately, the analytical method that Jason mentioned does measure a lot more types of PFAS. So we're getting all of that data along the way, and we just didn't have time to show plot after plot today, um, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately. Um, so recognizing one constraint is that we're working with the natural groundwater that has whatever levels of PFAS it has. So some PFAS we just don't have. They're just not, de not detected in our water, which means we're not going to see the performance comparison for a particular PFAS um, if it's not present in the influent for the different products. But for those limited types of PFAS that are present, we're going to develop those comparisons. Um, it's a little hard to interpret when there's not, if there is not at that time, a notification limit or MCL for the, the compound, but it's still certainly of interest to just generally see. Um, you, you know, it's possible that a product that performs really well and has an excellent price point for removing PFOA, perhaps it's um, kind of a medium performer for removing other, in terms of how long it lasts for removing other PFAS. So I think that'll be interesting. Um, Jacob's team, um, Scott's team is developing, you know, a report for this project. And so um, we plan to have a lot of that sort of extra information about all the other PFAS available. Thank you. Our next question comes to us from Jesus Gastelum. Have you started to consider or plan for disposal of treatment PFAS waste? Um, maybe Jason could chime in on that, but you know, our treatment study is focused on kind of evaluating the, the products as far as what to do with the waste. So again, this will be sort of part of the thinking of the operational plan for each site. So the, the GAC products could be potentially disposed of in a landfill or reactivated if that's the, the path the water retailer chooses to take, depending on if that service is available from the manufacturer and how much it costs. Um, the ion exchange resins that we're looking at um, are all single use, so they would be disposed of. And the novel adsorbents, I know at least one of them could be regenerated and returned to the site and reused again, kind of like a reactivated GAC. So again, it'll just depend on kind of the logistics of that and cost and whether just, just straight up disposal to landfill might be of more interest. So Jason, I don't know if you want to add to that, just based on kind of the conversations happening as far as the, the different cities and their, their interests, so that might just still be to be determined. No, I don't really have anything to add. I think you covered it. Um, I think largely, um, you know, as you alluded to, many people, um, many of the vendors who supply the media uh, also supply the, the disposal service as a part of the change out um, as well. And so I think um, initially that, that's an option I think that's being being considered as opposed to having utility be directly responsible for it. All right, thank you. Our next question, it came in anonymously. Are there complications or things to consider when expanding existing treatment in places where the treatment solutions already exist but more is needed? I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but maybe you do, Scott. Maybe you can repeat it one more time, Crystal. Since I'm pushing off, Scott. <laughs> Go back here. Um, are there complications or things to consider when expanding existing treatment in places where the treatment solutions already exist, but more is needed? I guess if the question is re around, you know, existing treatment exists, say for hardness or iron and manganese, 
Um, you know, there's there, there's always design factors that you have to consider. Uh, you know, when you're you're adding another unit operation for another constituent like PFAS. So, I mean, I, I think that that's often part of any engineering exercise. Um, in in quite frankly, the the biggest constraint, especially in Southern California, always tends to be footprint at that point. Um, if the question is more, we we have PFAS treatment in and we need more. I I'm I'm not exactly certain, um, you know, if, if that's really um, kind of the angle of the question, but, you know, certainly as we're, I guess, getting back to Megan's uh, response to the previous question, um, even though we didn't present a lot of it, we only had one slide, you know, we are looking at other PFAS compounds that um, are, are the wider list of the analytical um, suite. And in, although we don't have numerical um, criteria to compare them to, you know, it, those are being considered as part of the evaluation as well, um, you know, for, for looking into the future. So theoretically, you might just change out your adsorbent more frequently because perhaps you have a change in your feed water quality. And so you need mm -hmm. more PFAS to be removed and maybe you're reaching breakthrough faster or maybe you've got more competition because of other organics. So because the, these adsorbents remove it down to, can remove the PFAS down to non-detect. It's just that at a certain point, it'll start to be, it'll, the effluent concentration will increase. So that drives your change out time. So maybe that's another way to answer the question is that your mm -hmm. operational plan might differ a little bit as if your situation changes, maybe you're having to change it more frequently. That's a good point. All right, our next question is also anonymous. You mentioned subbituminous carbon. Was this tested in your study? Uh, short answer is no. Um, you know, we, we had a whole bunch of products to go through and select and make decision points on with a limited number of columns to test. And um, that, that particular product based on previous results that we had seen didn't necessarily make the, the, the list for the, the, the products that we ended up selecting for testing. The next question comes to us from Troy Edwards. What specific characteristics do the novel adsorbents you're testing have, and how do they differ from the GAC and ion exchange resin products? Well, um, specific characteristics, I would say, fall right into uh, Megan's last response, which was, um, I think that these next generation of adsorbents uh, that are coming to market are, are going to be more selective towards PFAS and in maybe selective to a wider range of PFAS. So that's one of the intriguing reasons to test it. And, and to Megan's point of um, even if they're not specifically ready for the first install, if conditions change or regulations expand, you know, they, they may be the viable alternative um, for operation using the same capital equipment in the future. Um, how they differ is, is basically base material. Uh, Megan's slide at the beginning talked about that. There's uh, neither of them are carbon or ion exchange. Their they're manufactured base material products are different. And one of them is like a mined material that's been modified and the other is um, a cyclodextrin based um, synthesized material, right Scott? Correct. So pretty different yep. sort of histories of how they're made. Right. All right, we have about five more minutes left for questions. Again, if we don't get to your question, please email us at info at ocwd.com and we will do our best to respond and get you an answer. So this one comes from Al Niederhood. Um, how does this test inform choices for future PFAS related regulations from California and choices to refine treatment to address new regulations? Hmm. We had a similar question earlier. How does this test inform choices for future PFAS regulations? So we're aware that the state uh, is um, going, going to be developing limits for other types of PFAS, whether they're notification limits or eventually MCLs. Um, we're only able to, we are measuring all that we can in terms of this standard analytical method that gives you the, the concentration of a lot of different types of PFAS. So we're collecting those breakthrough curves and, and that performance assessment for lots of, uh, for several different PFAS that are in, if, if they're in our source water. Um, but our slides today just talked about PFOA. Um, I think that 
to kind of build on Scott's earlier comment, in theory, a city could put in a certain particular product A where it has a good value, good performance, and perhaps as um, if and when the regulations evolved, we could go back to the findings from this study and perhaps there would be motivation to switch to a different um, adsorbent that might have a little better performance for a particular PFAS that's now being regulated. Or maybe at that time on the market, there'll be newer, better products coming in at lower, lower costs as the industry just keeps um, maturing. Um, so I think that's, I think we can be pretty flexible in that sense. Jason, I don't know if you want to add to that. You know, how do we kind of think about how this testing informs, you know, potential future regulations for PFAS? I think there was a second part of the question that I might have missed. Yeah, I think you, I think you largely covered it, Megan. The only okay. thing I would add is that um, as a state proceeds towards an MCL, um, you know, a part of uh, a part of the MCL development um, does take into account the uh, the ec economic ramifications of treatment or the cost of treatment is a piece of that analysis, and so. Um, I could see our work here and, and the initial full-scale systems that come from it, um, the cost associated with those um, being a, a, something that the state considers um, as they put the, the final MCL together. All right, we have time now just for two more questions. I know there are quite a few of you who haven't gotten your question answered yet. Um, there's just a lot of interest in this topic. Again, please email us at info at ocwd.com should we not get to your question. Um, so this one comes from Nishil Mohammed. I apologize if I've pronounced your name wrong. Uh, your results su suggest that the bituminous GACs outperform non-bituminous GACs. What is the main reason? Is it because of the quality of coal from which they're made or any difference in their hydrophobic properties of GAC poor? Um, I'm gonna answer that question more generally and, and it, it often has to do both with surface chemistry and the distribution of pore structure. Um, the, the, the base material is not just the base material, but, but it also kind of dictates the amount of transport pores and micro surface pores that, that actually, um, actually absorb the, the PFAS molecules. So there's a lot of dynamics you know, going on there and it's probably a very complicated and, and detailed question to answer. But in general, um, it does have to do with the material, but it's, it's not only the base material chemical properties, but also how it's activated in the process and, and what the resulting pore structure looks like. All right, and the final question for today comes to us from Tyler Butel. In the pilot comparison between ion exchange and GAC, what is the background DOC? What other background water quality parameters are present that impact ion exchange performance? So that's the, that, that is the, the well that has the 1.6 milligrams per liter. So that was the higher D, uh, DOC well um, that has the comparative performance. And in, in certainly with the influence of the high DOC, um, just proximity wise, if you saw Megan's um, graphic, the, the well is adjacent to one of the, the recharge basins. So it, it is definitely getting that, that influence in, in the background. Inorganics are a bit higher as well. Um, I don't have those in front of me, but they're, but they're certainly influencing the removal um, aspects. Uh, the, you know, the TOC and the, the, the background inorganics for, for both of those types of GAC and ion exchange systems um, that, that we're you know, evaluating in the pilot. Well, that is all the time that we have today. Thank you so much to Dr. Megan Plumley and Dr. Scott Grieco for joining us and sharing their expertise and results with the audience. And thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you found this webinar informative. As a reminder, a copy of the webinar will be emailed to attendees tomorrow, as well as posted to the district's YouTube channel. Our next webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, July 21st, and will focus on OCWD's Natural Resources Program, and additional information is available on our website. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.